we were all children once. But some children never grow up to their potential. And some never grow up at all. Every day in our world, 40,000 children die. Each death, the death of a child who had a personality and a potential, a family and a future. Forty thousand a day, a quarter of a million a week, a child every two seconds. And behind every child who dies, ten more live on with malnutrition, unable to grow normally in body or in mind. By any measure, this is the greatest tragedy of our times. But because it happens every day, it simply isn't news. But if we could see inside the millions of ordinary homes where this daily disaster happens, if we could sit for a while with the parents, we would see then that more than half of today's child deaths and half of today's child malnutrition are caused by the sheer frequency of a few common illnesses. Five specific illnesses. Diarrheal dehydration, measles, whooping cough, tetanus, pneumonia. These five, half, of all child deaths. No earthquake, no famine, no flood ever killed 40,000 children in a single day. Yet this is the toll taken by malnutrition and disease every day. And though these children of the quiet catastrophe never make the headlines, they are just as dead. And the love and the hopes of their families are just as surely turned to grief. Eso no es abonazo a las madres, no que eso nos, sac nos sacudía a varias madres perder nuestros hijos. And parents grieve not only for the dead, but for the millions of the malnourished. This is not the visible malnutrition of famine. It's subtler by far. But it afflicts a quarter of our world's young children and saps the development of people and of nations. The voice of the past says that this has always happened, that it's inevitable. But in the 1990s, that's simply no longer true. Today's knowledge holds out the chance, for the first time in history, of protecting the lives and the normal growth of all the world's children. And the breakthroughs are quite specific. New vaccines and a new commitment have immunized three quarters of the poor world's children. This year alone, the immunization effort will save two and a half million young lives and prevent over a quarter of a million from being crippled by polio. But 8,000 children are still dying every day from diseases which vaccines can prevent. And 500 are still crippled every day by polio. The biggest killer of all, dehydration. It can now be prevented by low-cost oral rehydration therapy. In the last five years, this simple technique has been taught to one family in three in the developing world. And it's saving over a million lives a year. But it could save more than twice as many if only it were used by every country and by every family. It's also now known that longer intervals between births could reduce by as much as one-third the heavy toll of deaths among mothers as well as children. And with new knowledge, especially about growth monitoring, breastfeeding, weaning, and preventing and coping with illness, 
even the age-old problem of malnutrition could now be solved. The annual cost, less than $10 per child. The simple, the obvious, the affordable can now reduce the toll of frequent illness, poor growth, and early death. Specifically, today's knowledge could defeat the top five causes of child death and child malnutrition in virtually every developing country. The total cost might be an extra two and a half billion dollars a year, less than the world now spends on the military every single day. But today's knowledge can do more than reduce the quantity of death. It can improve the quality of life. It can bring adequate food, clean water, and primary health care. And even in some of the world's poorest countries, education has been provided for all at an affordable cost. In particular, the education of girls is probably the world's best investment for improving the lives and the health of children, for reducing birth rates, and for ending the wasteful and shameful discrimination against girls and women in almost every country. Last year, there was even a breakthrough against the abuse of children in all its forms. Like many such documents in history, the Convention begins life as just a piece of paper, but a paper which will one day become the standard below which any civilized nation, rich or poor, will be ashamed to fall. A standard at work, a standard at war, in our streets, and in our homes. But the Convention is also concerned about the children of the industrialized world, where one child in ten lives with poverty and hunger in the midst of plenty, where one child in six suffers the breakdown of the family. where unknown numbers suffer mental or physical abuse, and millions live with loveless affluence. Many are the problems, many are the causes, but the greatest threat to our world's children remains ordinary, everyday poverty. Poverty which will not be overcome without a solution to debt, a renewal of investment, an increase in aid, and the kind of economic growth in which the poor have a share. But as part of that struggle, the children of the world have a right to ask that we do what can now be done to protect them through the vulnerable years. They have a right to ask simply because they are children for a first call on our concern. Today, whether a child survives or not, is well nourished or not, is immunized or not, has a school to go to or not, should not depend on whether interest rates rise or fall, on whether commodity prices go up or down, on whether the economy is growing or in recession, or on whether any one political party is in power. Children only have one chance to grow normally in mind and body. That one chance should be given a clear priority in allocating our society's resources. And children should be able to depend on that commitment in good times and in bad. Basic protection for all the world's children is no longer a question of possibility. It's a question of political priority.
To put today's known solutions into action on the necessary scale depends on sustained leadership from the highest levels. From leaders who demand regular reports on immunization levels, on the war against preventable disease and malnutrition, on school enrollment rates, and on the progress of today's low-cost solutions. From leaders who insist that the growth of their nation's children should be as well monitored as the growth of their economies. From leaders who begin an information revolution for the poor to put today's knowledge and essential services at the disposal of all. And in the industrialized world, from leaders who insist that a first call on aid programs should be for the protection of the most vulnerable and from leaders who commit their governments to the principle of first call for children at home. The moral case is an obvious one, but the practical arguments too are becoming overwhelming. Poverty, turmoil and environmental degradation are perpetuated by ill health, poor nutrition and illiteracy. Unnecessary child deaths prevent the acceptance of family planning, pushing millions of parents into having more children than they want so that some may survive. A renewal of the international effort to meet the needs of all children is therefore the greatest investment the human race could make in its economic prosperity, political stability and environmental integrity an investment not only in today's children, but in tomorrow's world. No gathering in history has ever had such power to make this greatest of all investments, to commit the nations of the world to this greatest of all causes, to achieve in our times this greatest of all goals, and to end the quiet catastrophe.